Good morning to you all. Nice to see you here today. A bit chilly. Can't shut the doors either, but never mind. I haven't, I haven't got any notices myself, but Roger wants me to remind you. December the 3rd, is it? Royal Oak, Bowls and Carols. Seventh clock. Yes, it's a good time. Have a good sing. It's our pleasure to welcome Andrew Webster to us today, to lead us in worship and bring us closer to our Lord Jesus. So let's prepare for this service and just have a few moments of quiet as we bring ourselves into the presence of our Lord Jesus. Remembering, remembering those lovely words, I shall never leave you, I shall never forsake you. Lord bless us this day and bless our friend Andrew. Friends, good morning, and what a privilege it is to be here to lead our worship. Blessed are you, God of Israel, forever and ever. For yours is the greatness, yours the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. Shall we worship the living God with hymn number 57, Let All the World in Every Corner Sing. Shall we be together in prayer? Let us pray. We gather this morning to bring our praise and our worship. For Lord, everything in heaven and on earth is yours. For yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are to be exalted as head over all. All riches and honors come from you, and you rule over all. In your hands are power and might. Yours it is to give power and strength to all. And we gather to give thanks to you, our God, and praise your holy name. For all things come from you, and in worship we return what is already your own. 
So praise be to you, O God, maker of the universe, by whose wisdom and word we are created and sustained. Praise be to you, O God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whose law we are redeemed and forgiven. Praise be to you, O God, the source of all holiness, by whose spirits we are made whole and brought to perfection. Praise be to you, O God, the source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now and shall be forever. Amen. We continue our prayers with a recognition of our human frailty. For as we declare and praise and bring glory to God, we are very aware of our limitations, of our shortcomings, very aware of our need for God. Holy Father, we recognize we do not always live the lives that you've called us to live. We recognize our neglect of you, of one another, and of ourselves. In our frailty and fragility, in our creatureness, we turn to you, our creator, and ask for your mercy. And may we hear that word of grace that that you proclaim forgiveness, that you proclaim restoration and renewal. May we know the truth of that in our lives, Lord. Eternal Father, whose Son Jesus Christ ascended to the throne of heaven, that he might rule over all things as Lord and King. May the church be in unity of the spirits, and may we be in the bond of peace. And may the whole of the created order come to worship at the Lord King's feet. The Lord who is alive and reigns with you, King over all. This prayer we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Perhaps you already know and perhaps you've heard a theme already in those prayers we've shared that today is the Sunday designated as Christ the King. So our psalm that I'm going to invite us to share now continues the kingly theme and this is a, a, a reflection and exhortation of the, the qualities that God would look for that we, we, we seek in a kingly figure. So this is Psalm 72, and we've got the words here on the screen. And perhaps if we read them alternately, I'll read the first verse, and then we can all join in and do it alternately. So this is Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people of righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. And all give deliverance to the and corrupt. May he live while the sun endures, and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May strife rain fall on the earth, like showers of in his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. May he have dominion on streets and from the rivers end the world. May his foes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Christ and all the fathers render him May the kings of Sheba and Seba submit. May all the kings fall down before him, all nations give him service. For he delivers the deep when they fall, the poor and those who are happy. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. 
from oppression on high, be redeemed that are on precious things that are low. Friends, I've already um, been multiply blessed this morning. Not only is it a, a joy and a privilege to be here, uh, the journey of the White Valley was tremendous this morning. So thank you for inviting on the sunniest, many more from the day of trees and the leaves. It was a beautiful journey. So I, I've already considered myself greatly blessed. Christ the King, the last, again, it's the last Sunday of the church here. Designated Christ. Time body to ponder. A time or a situation or a scenario where there was a, somebody who had authority over you. Somebody who told you what to do and you have to do it. Maybe you have to think quite hard back, back in your, your school days. Perhaps you had quite a domineering. Head teacher whose word was law. Best to learn. Perhaps that was, that was enforced. Our, our Mr. Patterson, whose word was law, he enforced his word, enforced his law by hitting anybody who disagreed with him. We did what we were told. Perhaps you had a military experience. I was spending some time with somebody who was in the Navy, and uh, perhaps in all military scenarios, it's true, but particularly on a ship, and he had to serve on a, a submarine. And he said the captain, well, he had tremendous authority, and perhaps necessarily so, because uh, things have to be done a certain way in a very tight and cold environment. In fact, the captain quite looked you hierarchical, and everybody knew their place, and everybody did what they were told by their superiors. They speak as fathers. Perhaps you're still working. Like me, you have a chief executive. And it's generally advisable to do what a chief executive asks you to do. Usually you get asked, and then you get told, don't you? So you can set you to do it early on. Because in these situations, often it's power and authority on behalf of all. It's a, a, a designated authority. Why take representatives of them and force it? A force it in the heart of someone else. Now. So there are, there are rules and regulations now that, that prevent teachers from getting too carried away into the chalkboard. You know the chalkboard brother? Is it called the brother? The head wooden thing? That if you misspell kick off, it's thrown at you. And Mr. Patterson could, and I think it's remarkable, he could from the back of the back and he could hit you with it and the back of the head without fail. I don't think you're allowed to do that now. <laughs> Just like bosses can't fire and fire willy nilly body, they have to hold it. And even in the military, the commanding officer so he had authority, or she had authority, but on behalf of Wider military covenant, if you like, that, that, that they themselves are subject to. What did our pastor do? And you've done what you were told. It's interesting to reflect that makes it seem that what we were told was meaningless. But it's actually, it was actually changing internally. Externally, we're doing what we're meant to. We're doing what we're working with. But we're actually changing as people. How influential our priest was. Was it? Did the nature of forest work that reflect on our following Jesus and working on sin and other things? And I'm not sure if it's just is this new to the group folks here at one minute. It's, it's a fine domain name, so let's see. It's 318, um, Christ our King before freedom.
We're now going to hear our gospel reading appointed for this Sunday. It's from, ja from John chapter 18, and I'm pleased that Mike is going to read for us. Mike is hoping this technology is going to work. The King of the Jews. They led Jesus then from Caiaphas to the Roman governor's palace. It was early morning. They themselves didn't enter the palace because they didn't want to be disqualified from eating the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and spoke. What charge do you bring against this man? And they said, if he hadn't been doing something evil, do you think we'd be here bothering you? Pilate replied, well, you take him, judge him by your law. The Jews said, we're not allowed to kill anyone. This would confirm Jesus's word, indicating the way he would die. The pilot went back into the palace and then he called for Jesus and he said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own or did others tell you this about me? Pilate said, do I look like a Jew? Your people and your high priests turned you over to me. What did you do? My kingdom, said Jesus, doesn't consist of what you see around you. If it did, my followers would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But I am not that kind of king, not the world's king of king, kind of king. Then Pilate said, so, are you a king or not? Jesus answered, you tell me, because I am king, I was born and entered the world so that I could witness to the truth. Everyone who cares for truth, who has any feeling for the truth, recognizes my voice. To which Pilate said, what is truth? Mike, thank you for reading for us. The Sunday designated Christ the King. And I think part of the idea is that this is the end of the church year, the liturgical year. It all begins again next Sunday with the first Sunday of Advent. And I think the idea is that as we've gone round the, the church year here, it's the, the climax, it, the culmination is that for all that has gone uh, before us, Christ is proclaimed as king, the one who has authority over all. And that's absolutely what as Christians we, we would want to proclaim. However, the however is that perhaps we need to be a little bit careful. Careful because Jesus himself, during his life on earth, he seemed quite hesitant to accept the title and be proclaimed king. Throughout his ministry, there was an ambivalence to how people were to refer to him, reluctance to proclaim as, as being good, for example, in the encounter with the, the ritual man. Reluctant to um, acknowledge that he was the Messiah and seemingly very hesitant to be called a king. Today's got another name as well. Not only is it Sunday for Christ's kingship, it's also Stir Up Sunday. 
I'm taking my glasses off because I can't see you with them on. So I'm just seeing if everybody's nodding. Are we familiar with the concept of stir up Sunday in Monmouth? Thank you. Because that makes more sense than what I'm about to say now. <laughs> stir the day we make our Christmas cakes, isn't it? And perhaps Christmas pudding as well. And we stir it all up and get it ready. So in about five weeks' time, the cake's just just right you stir it up today you start your cooking and then now and again you start adding a bit of sherry or a bit of brandy depending you know i know a methodist so perhaps it's you know we're restrained and if you're my grandma you put gallons of the stuff on it and they're all intoxicated by christmas but stir up sunday can i put those two together that perhaps yes it is sunday for christ's kingship but Maybe Christ himself, Jesus, stirs up our, our understanding of what it means to have authority and how it is to conduct and hold and share power and, and, and control. And that, that Jesus stirs up our notions. You see, this reluctance to be proclaimed king was there in this, this interesting, this intriguing dialogue with with Pilate, he, he, he doesn't want to get drawn into uh, saying that he's king. Maybe there's a, well, it's too late now. It, it might have been originally to you be wary proclaiming yourself king because that's a sure way of getting yourself into serious trouble, but he's already in serious trouble. So it's more than just that. It's, it seems to be, a, it's a bit of a dance almost, isn't it? Pilate's trying to pin him down and say, well, are you a king? They tell me you're a king. Are you? What, what kind of king? And Jesus is, is perhaps infuriates Pilate, doesn't he? Because he won't answer the question quite right. He's giving ambiguous answers and he's, he's taking a conversation way beyond anything Pilate seems to understand. But the reluctance to be called a king was there. Well, earlier on in John, after feeding of the 5,000, we're told that the crowds came and, and Jesus, Jesus uh, fled effectively because he, he knew that they were going to make him king by force. So impressed by the miracle of feeding the 5,000 that they wanted to make him king and Jesus wasn't having it. But whilst he's reluctant to take the title king, he, of course, acknowledges here that he has a kingdom. So perhaps there's a awareness with Jesus that he is very wary of being associated with how kings are understood to operate. That he has a radically different understanding of what it means to be a monarch. And he didn't want to be labeled or pigeonholed or reduced by the, the worldly understanding because he was stirring up what it meant to be a king. It's ambivalence on behalf of Jesus to, to, to embrace kingship as the world understands it. I wonder if in part it's rooted in, in God's reluctance for Israel to have a king in the first place. You might recall right, right back in, in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, there's a a very telling passage. Up to that point in Israel history, they had not had kings. They had not had monarchy. They had been guided by prophets or, or judges and, and holy people. And the, the idea was that through the, the, the law given through Moses, that's what they needed to govern their affairs. That, that authority was exercised through the, the, the prophets and through the, the judges, through the following the law, adherence to the law, and that, that God was their king. And there's no need for an earthly monarch. But the Israelites wanted a king. And they kept going on about having a king. And they kept going to Samuel. They would give us a king. Put somebody on a throne, as it were. And God was reluctant. And in a really telling passage from 1 Samuel 8. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. He said this, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he'll appoint himself commander over thousands and commanders of fifties. 
and some will be appointed to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment for his wars. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He'll take one tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He'll take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one tenth of your flocks and he sh you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you'll cry out to your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. They will cry out to God because of your king, whom you've chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. That's quite a powerful indictment of the notion of a, a monarchy, isn't it? That, that, that God knew how it would go and the idea that, 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 that there'd be a, one figure who, who accumulated great wealth at the expense of his people, who had great power, who would put sons into the army and daughters to work, the hint there of, of exploitation and a hierarchical accumulation of wealth and power, that it seems to be that wasn't God's intention for his people, the Israelites. Is that why Jesus was reluctant to endorse the earthly notions of kinghood that, that, that he knew from the very beginning that wasn't really the plan? And of course, Israel did have a king, and at times it worked wonderfully with, obviously, most famously David and perhaps Solomon, but there's plenty of others who fell away and were a great disappointment to a lot of the uh, Jewish scriptures is the tension between the, the kings who are ruling unjustly and, and exploitively and, and, and the prophets trying to bring them back to God's way and, and, and the conflicts that are there. But in many ways, the, the Israelite monarchy did fail. And much of what was prophesied there by Samuel came to pass. And of course, it's not just in Israelite history where the accumulation of great wealth and power at the expense and exploitation of others has become a reality. Of course, the idea of using one's position of power to enrich yourself is, is totally alien in our day and age. And we never have anybody in power using that to their advantage. But it's telling that Jesus was very reluctant to proclaim king. I wonder if, if that was why. And his understanding of authority is very different. Certainly the authorities of his day, well, we had it there in our passage, didn't we? His encounter with Pilate, Pilate, who, you know, the, the representative of the Roman Empire, uh, an empire built on military conquest, on might, on domination, controlled by, by fear. The, the, the thing about crucifixion um, was so prominent in such a, a public way of, 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 of enforcing through fear the, your control and, 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 and generating people's acquiescence because of, of terror, really. But not just great military, it was great administrative control. The Romans incredibly efficient and well organized and all the, these wonderful roads and things. Part of that was that they were able to control a massive empire very efficiently by the standards of their day. And of course, economic power as well. I may be wrong about this, but I was told recently that the, the first people to start putting the rulers head on the coins was, 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 was the Romans because they, you know, an ordinary person would never see Caesar in the flesh. So, so by putting the, the image of Caesar on a coin that was then in everybody's pockets or purses or pouches, that, that, that they, they would actually have some way of, of seeing who was in, in control. And of course, the person who controls your money or, or your wealth, that's, that's quite a powerful thing, isn't it? And remember that encounter Jesus had about, you know, show me a coin and whose, whose image is there and render under Caesar what he sees. Is that, that was another way that, that authority and power was exerted, represented here by Pilate who seems completely bemused in his meeting with Jesus, this, this carpenter who some are calling a king, who won't answer his questions, who, well, there's a total culture clash, isn't there, between the type of authority Pilate represents and this kingdom that Jesus is starting to talk about, that is not of this world. There's 
Roman might and military power. There's religious authority here as well. The, the priests who were very keen to, to get rid of Jesus. The, the religious authorities who are going to such great lengths to maintain the, not just control of people's spiritual, religious lives, of, in their minds, preserving the, the purity of their faith. That perhaps sometimes with the best intentions, the Pharisees and priests had become very controlling, stifling, oppressive, and here, extreme consequences for the one who would challenge their authority and who didn't fit into their ideas of what a rabbi ought to be. Going to great lengths to ensure that he might be executed. Because as they said themselves, they weren't allowed to. So they were trying to imply, implicate Rome and ensure Jesus' demise. And the thing about religious authority is that you and I know throughout history, there's been many examples where if religions have gained too much power and authority, it's often not actually ended very well. When I used to work in Oxford, there was a bit of a tourist trail there's lots of history in Oxford as I'm sure you know and one of the, the places to stop and look was on these massive wooden doors outside one of the very historical colleges and and you could still see the the char the burn marks and black marks and flames and they were told these were flames so when when they used to burn heretics in Oxford there was quite a lot of burning of heretics going on a few centuries ago and that was Christians putting Christians on a fire and the fire was so enormous that it, it, it scorched this college door. To actually think about that, it's actually quite horrific, isn't it? That somebody who saw things differently might be burnt alive. But all sorts of things have happened when religious people have had too much power and authority and become utterly unanchored from their moral compass. You see, Jesus is demonstrating a wholly different type of authority. He's so at odds with these worldly views of kingship and deeds, you could also say priesthood. And it is interesting that for all his radical difference here in the scriptures, throughout our history as a church, there's been times when we seem to be reluctant to, to embrace his notions of authority and have fallen into worldly understandings that sometimes Churches have been closer to the kingdom of the earth than kingdoms of heaven. A couple of weeks ago, I had a, a significant birthday. And to celebrate our, our, my family, they took me to London. And I found myself on my 50th birthday in London. I thought, to go to church, do something different. So I went to Westminster Abbey. Uh, I'd visited before, but never to worship. I thought it's good to do something different, something that's like your normal cup of tea. So I went to, we, so we stayed in, and we walk, I walked to Westminster Abbey, and uh, perhaps you've been. It's, it is in some ways a tremendous piece of architecture. It's something else, the scale of it, and of course the history of it. And uh, you can perhaps imagine the choir and, and the altars and the uh, pomp and circle. It was, it was everything you might have expected from the well, from the nation's cathedral, I suppose. But I came away with a strange feeling of ambivalence. So I know what, at the best, they're trying to be. They're trying to capture something of awe and wonder. Something of what we, we shared in our prayers of the, of the majesty of God and to capture that in the, the architecture and, and the music and the liturgy and the way. I, I, I get that they're trying to do that, or we're trying to do that in worship. But then sometimes you do wonder, is that what Jesus had in mind? And of course, sometimes the uh, ways of doing church have gone too dominant, and some people have found it oppressive, and there's been breakaway movements, and of course that was Methodism ourselves. We, we sort of broke away when church and state have become too powerful, too intertwined, too controlling, so nonconformity comes along, and we try and do our own things. We, we try and perhaps do it more simpler, more, more humbly, we'd like to say ourselves, and we tell ourselves that, but of course... Uh, you, you leave Westminster Abbey, and if you know the arrangements of London, that's in the centre of power near Parliament and all that sort of thing. You leave Westminster Abbey, that great power and authority, and you look across the road, 
And the Methodists built themselves their own massive great um, Westminster Central Hall that's almost as big. And why is this not as ornate? You can see that after two or three generations of non-conformity trying to be small and humble, we ourselves start to buy into the idea that big is beautiful and imposing. And you sometimes, sometimes things need to be stirred up in each generation because we can lose our way and get too drawn into notions of how power and authority ought to be exercised. And perhaps we just forget, forget that well, when Jesus was proclaimed king, those instances in his life, at his birth, remember? Remember how, how, how the psalm we just shared came to be fulfilled, that, that kings, princes, monarchs from around the world came to pay tribute at his birth, and we'll be telling the story again in a few weeks, that these kings, these wise men, went looking for a king, and they went to the palace, and they tipped off the king of the Jews, Herod, because they'd gone to the wrong place, so misguided were they. And, of course, they discover the true king and the prince of peace in a stable and in a manger. From the beginning of his life, he was stirring up notions of what true power and kingship looks like. And at the other end of his life, at his crucifixion, he was proclaimed king in three different languages. Jesus, king of the Jews, there on a plaque on his cross. You see, Pilate famously ended this interaction with saying to Jesus, what, what is true? And of course, as a, a, a thousand wise tomes have been written philosophically about what truth might be. But that question of Pilate's was answered in the most profound way. And just prior to his crucifixion, he's whipped and this king receives his crown, his crown of thorns. And then when he's enthroned, he's enthroned on a cross, that this is the deepest truth of Jesus's kingship. This is what it means to be a monarch in the kingdom of heaven. And of course, everything in between was also a demonstration of a completely different way of doing things. This life of humility, this life of service, this life that... Reflecting on it theologically, Paul in Philippians talks about Christ's humility, the one who was equal with God, who did not retain that, but emptied himself of everything, taking the form of his slave, being born in human likeness, humbling himself to the point, even obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, he is exalted. And therefore, at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. That's the essence of kingship for Christ. That profound humility, that life poured out, that self-emptying himself of everything but love because of love. That's the king whom we are invited to have authority over us. And do you remember earlier when I said about people who've had power and authority over us and whether we do is what we're told because we have to or because they're genuinely changing us? The way that Jesus, the King, exercised authority, not through coercion, not because he is God's son, but by this amazing, powerful persuasion of his love. It's an invitation and it's never a command with Jesus. But the persuasion comes from this act of self-emptying, even to the point of death on the cross, for all of creation ourselves included. That's what it is to exercise authority in the kingdom of heaven. And for some of us, it is utterly and completely compelling. And the invitation that comes with the invitation to give Christ authority over us as king, to bow our knee, is to allow that worship to shape us and our lives. 
You see, sometimes I wonder if this temptation to, to, to replicate earthly understandings of kingship and put Christ up on a heavenly throne and, 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 and celebrate his majesty as, as we ought to do, that the, the one danger with that is that, that, that Christ becomes so other that we so emphasize the awe and the wonder that, that those profound words that we, we shared in our prayers that come straight from, from the scripture about the majesty and the glory and the might and the power all profoundly true, that that becomes too distant and that the kneeling in worship is separated from the kneeling in service. And we remind ourselves of the pattern of life and ministry that Christ followed not only fulfilling what we heard in our psalm about a king who's concerned for justice, who's against oppression, not only the one who has regard for the poor as a good king ought to, but the one who went even further and identified himself with the poor, who sought those who are on the margins, the, the outcasts, the least, and the lost, and the nobodies, and, and said, here is my kingdom. And that's where he, he, he lives so much of his life. And it's a, this turning upside down of hierarchies. And perhaps something so profoundly different like that. Somebody quite helpfully said, rather than talking about kingdom, knock out the G and talk about kingdom, as in, as in family, as in the almighty God who now is our brother and friend, as well as a king, that, that he is in kinship, especially with those who are the least and the most lost. And in very stratified societies, it's those at the bottom, the last, who are now first. So in our own living, in our own lives, the invitation is to say, yes, Christ reign in me have authority over me, shape my life, guide my life. But we're invited, we're not compelled, and is the invitation is, is a loving one. But as well as the invitation to proclaim Christ as king and bow the knee in worship, can we allow that same king to, to shape us and transform us, that we too will live lives where not only is it a life of, of service and in, in humility, but can we ask Christ to open our eyes to see him at work and present and active in the same places that he always was? That just as we're told uh, in this encounter with Pilate that, that, that anybody's practicing truth, that the truth is almost like oh, always there and, and that, that, that anybody who's, who's, who's doing this, is, 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 who gets it, is, is, is in tune with God. That we ourselves will start learning to pay attention. That as we try to embody this humble way of doing authority, we might become increasingly aware of God active in the world and, and, and we might even join in humbly. And finally, we'll end with just a, a word of grace. Many years ago, not this trip to London, another trip to London, the first time we took our youngest daughter. We said, we're going to London and we're going to go and see the Queen. In fact, we're going to have a cup of tea with the Queen. And she was quite pleased about this. And we did go to Buckingham Palace and stand at the gates and wait for hours for the soldiers to do something because they did a lot of standing and not much else. And I was, oh, we're going to go now. And she said, oh, I, th I, thought, I thought we were, I thought we were going to go and see the Queen. And, and, and she thought we'd been serious. She said, no, you see, we're going to have a cup of tea with the Queen. She genuinely thought that you could walk into the, through, walk through the gates of Buckingham Palace and go and knock on Her Majesty's door and have a cup of tea with the Queen. There's something about this humility of Christ's kingship, where that level of accessibility to the Lord God Almighty becomes a reality for all of us. In fact, even more than that, it's not even going to a palace, is it? It's the, it's the occupant of the palace leaving and coming and meeting us on the streets. And the good news is if we are one of those who find themselves a bit lost or a bit amongst the least, if we ourselves find, a, 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 knowing our, our great need to, to be reconciled with God, if, if we are in need of hearing a word of grace, if, at the royal banquets with Christ as host, such is the great love that there's a place for all of us, including me and you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
thank you that as you hold the entire universe in your hand, a world created through your words, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. Heavenly Father, may we be open to that invitation, the, the invitation to say, yes, come and reign. Come and reign in us, in our lives, in our church, in our society. But Lord, may we have a, a truer understanding of what it is to, to know you as king. For Christ's humility, Lord, we thank you. For his coming amongst us, we thank you. For his ever-continuing presence among us, we thank you. Grant us, Lord, a, a desire to embody in our own living a humble service, a desire to, to serve those who are the marginalized or the least. Refresh us, Lord, in our understanding of what it means to say you are our king and we want to serve your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We do pray for anybody who is in need today asking that we might too be sensitive to their needs, responsive, ready to forsake any notions of status or power that we might want to cling to. That as we kneel in worship, we might also kneel in service. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Time to sing, friends. It's 272 from heaven you came help us babe it's the servant king
really see things. We'll continue in prayer and shall our time of prayer begin with some, some quiet to allow ourselves to settle in the presence of God and of one another. Now you know that God is so very attentive to our needs. That God is ever present to us, with us, and within our souls. And that in times of quiet, we make ourselves present to God's holy presence. And as we sit in God's presence, allow the concerns of your heart to rise up and offer them to the Lord. For all of us have concerns and burdens for the world that we carry. Perhaps there's something this past week that's come to your attention that, that's weighing heavily upon you. A great concern, perhaps, a, a great need or an injustice. Offer that to the Lord, asking that the kingdom of heaven might come in that situation. In situations where authority and power has been exercised with injustice and cruelty, where people have suffered great harm at the hands of the powerful, we ask that the kingdom might come on earth, that there might be healing, that justice might come. But we hear of the, the scriptural exhortation for there to be good news for the poor. May that be so, and may we play our part. May our own living, our own lives be the embodiment of Christ's lifestyle. That we might be humble. That we might not be greedy or self-obsessed. That we might not seek to gain but rather seek to serve. May we live with true reverence and regard for God's creation, playing our part in sustaining it for now and for future generations. That we might have a great reverence for all that God has given and conduct wise stewardship. Lord, I ask your blessing and guidance on your church here in Monmouth, thanking you for the, the fellowship and the faithfulness here, asking that the season of Advent and the coming of Christmas might be a time of joy, a time of eager anticipation. Open our eyes, Lord, that as we rehearse that well-known story, we, we may discover a fresh, deep truths and be compelled ever more to, to bow our knee at that manger. Place into your hands, Lord, the leadership of this church. and We pray for the Reverend Bethany, asking your guidance and your sustaining presence. May there be an attentiveness, Lord, to what you are asking and calling the faithful here to do. We do pray for those who have power and authority in our society, those who have been 
designated and delegated to to conduct and 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 and, and uphold that they may have wisdom and compassion that they may follow your your wisdom and 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 lead and govern according to your your will as revealed in the life of Jesus And Lord, may we forever hear that word of grace, that invitation given to all of us to take our place in your company, that you are very much with all of us and none are excluded from your royal circle. And as we proclaim you in all your glory and all your majesty and all your wonder, as we give you all praise, we also know your friendship and your companionship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shall we join together in the Lord's prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. Worship. I think I saw tables set out and stuff. Is, is coffee served today? Oh, that's, that's good news. That's another step out of lockdown, isn't it? A chance to share some, some fellowship. So do join us for a, a cup of tea. Before that, uh, our final hymn, and I'm, I'm furthering around it. I've lost my order of service. I can't remember what it is. It is. It's one eight five, and I've chosen this because this is this is this is the the end of the church year. Just to set you up lovely for Advent, sing we the King who's coming to reign. Glory to Jesus. Shall we stand and sing our final hymn?
May the love of the Father enfold us, the wisdom of the Son enlighten us, and the fire of the Spirit inflame us. And may the blessing of God, the one, the three in one, be upon us and abide with us now forever. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord and King, Jesus Christ. Amen.